of the customer base audit, so stay tuned. You're listening to The Focus Group with Tim and John. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. Now back to The Focus Group with Tim and John. Available pretty much everywhere. Welcome back to The Focus Group. John Nash with Tim Bennett here. Focusgroupradio.com is the URL for all you need to learn about me and Tim. Or I always get that wrong, Tim and me. <laughs> Including our Tuesday podcast, TFG Unbun. As promised for Shop Talk this week, we are welcoming to the show... Professor Peter Fader, he is the Francis and Pei Yun Cha Professor of Marketing at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. So right away, if I say Wharton, you know this guy knows business. And uh, he has a new book out called The Customer Base Audit, which we'll be discussing with him. And since Tim and I come from slightly different a aspects of the marketing and advertising world, I think this should be fun because I'm a creative director, and I always used to sit in on research to hear particular things. And Tim's a director of marketing, who would use research and data differently than I would. Uh, so right off the bat, I want to ask you something. The new book is called The Customer Base Audit, The First Step on the Journey to Customer Centricity. I like that word. If you had to do an elevator pitch for the book, you know, one of those two or three sentence things you give someone between the first floor and the sixth floor, <laughs> what would you say your elevator pitch is for the book? It all depends. It depends on who I'm on the elevator with. So um, if, if I'm with fellow marketers, then I'm going to really punch up the customer part and say, look, we're all talking about it. We all understand that customers aren't created equal. So let's be held accountable for it. Let, let's approach that in, in kind of a more rigorous, standardized way so we can make apples to apples comparisons across parts of our business, across different companies, across different years just to see how healthy the customer base is and therefore how healthy the company is. On the other hand, if I was on the elevator with some accountants and finance people, well, I'd get off on the next floor. No, no, no. <laughs> um, you I'd, you I'd, might I'd, actually, I might get <laughs> off with you too. I'd, uh, but, I'd, but if I was stuck with them and, and no one was responding when I pressed the emergency button, um, I'd punch up the audit part. Because uh, all those people understand the idea of doing this regular audit. They hate doing it, but it's really important and various stakeholders really depend on it. Uh, and, uh, and we feel that the doing an audit of the customer base is, is as important as doing an audit of the firm as a whole. And it can tell you all sorts of things about the broader health of the business and its financial valuation uh, and give all kinds of guidance about again, broad corporate strategy and not just day-to-day -day marketing tactics. You know, that audit term, I'm glad you're, you've refined that from here. You're using it in the context you just did because the minute you set up that um, comparison or metaphor, I instantly understood what you were getting at. When you audit the customer, you're actually looking at the customer base saying, what are our most frequent customers? What are they purchasing? What are our outliers? Are people buying on price only? Are they buying on brand only? It's a very clever thing. So one thing I would say that we get asked a lot um, at the start of every new year is, you know, <laughs> what should a brand or a company do as we march into the new year? And 2023 is a particularly interesting one. I think the last four or five have been fractured media landscape, uh, you know, the switch to living at home for a while when we had lockdown, changed consumer spending habits and buying habits. So what do you see and what would you say would be your top recommendations for brands and marketers in 2023. Yeah, you raised such a good point because for the past few years, <clears throat> for good and bad, we've been ride, riding a wave of kind of, you know, chaos, uh, which is, again, can be good as well as bad, uh, wh whether it is COVID, whether it is changes in technology, changes in, in the whole uh, ad space. Uh, and so a lot of companies have been, uh, I'd say, taking their eye off the ball of the customer base and focusing on either staying solvent through COVID um, or chasing after shiny objects like personalization and loyalty programs and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, I'm hoping that, that 2023 is going to bring us to a point of, of, of stability. 
where we don't have shiny objects to grasp for. We don't have excuses to make saying, oh, well, we wanted to do that customer thing, but COVID. Uh, and I think there's going to be more accountability. I think as, as, uh, as valuations of firms start to kind of come back to earth and are more appropriately reflective of the value of those companies and their customers, uh, as, as people start asking more questions about accountability instead of just sky's the limit spending, the kinds of points that, that you raised, who are the best customers, are they bargain hunters, or are they really truly loyal, uh, those kinds of questions are going to become much more front and center uh, for a lot of different businesses. And I hope we're in a position to help companies answer them well. So, so Peter, this is your third book. And the one of the themes that uh, I seem to have found over and over again that you discuss is this customer lifetime value or the CLV. And on top of what you had just explained to John, I, I often people often struggle as to how do you define a valuable customer and can you predict in the future if somebody will be? And I, I'd seen a lecture where you'd done and you, you gave an example of a big discounter which might um, really just go on pure volume but they're still customers. So I'm, I'm, so if you are selling widgets or whatever your product is, how do you decide, okay, this is going to be a valuable customer and this one will not? So it all comes down to this idea of being able to measure, project, and manage customer lifetime value. That's my day job. <laughs> That's the stuff that I've been doing as a professor for you know, decades now. Uh, the, the book writing is all pretty recent. That you know, Again, right. as a publisher or parish professor, uh, we, we focus on journal articles, Greek letters, lots of computational obfuscation. Uh, I'm not proud of that, although I, I like to believe I do it pretty well. So I've been basically refining these models of lifetime value and, and related concepts, customer retention, customer acquisition, just a lot of the kind of, you know, quanti customer metric stuff. I've been doing that for, for like you said, for decades. Uh, and the models really work. So our ability to look at some transaction log data, you know, who bought what when, and project how often they're going to consider buying from us uh, and how much will they spend when they do, and to kind of add all that up, that's customer so lifetime value. Right. You so really we've been doing do that have, really well. That's a solved problem. The hard part is getting people to pay attention to it. Getting so you're, to, you're very, you're very um, – there was no hesitation in your belief in the analysis side of this and the projection ahead. Um, which I find fascinating. So I'm going to throw something at you, which I think is an interesting, well, I hope is an interesting question. Do you think most businesses, small and large, operate on an a priori idea of their customers? A priori meaning, Latin meaning that which was before. Like I, I have an idea in my head of who's buying my brand. And, yes. and, you're, and you can come along and, and Peter Fader can come along with his, his analysis and you might be able to nudge me on this, but do you, do you find that as a resistance point that, that brands have an innate kind of, we know who we're talking to? Yes, and, and it's not necessarily a point of resistance. Sometimes it means they're embracing the idea of customer lifetime value. It's just that they don't need to run fancy schmancy models. They, they just understand it intuitively. Uh, and you know, if it's a really small business, and when I say that, I'm not referring to revenue, I'm referring to the size of the customer base. So whether you're uh, running a, a, a bodega or you're selling parts to airline manufacturers and you only have a you know, dozen customers, uh, if you really can see your customers at a granular level, you kind of know who the best ones are. You know whose call you're going to take at 2 o'clock in the morning and who can wait until Monday. Uh, so, so a lot of businesses do understand that and they might be right about it. The problem is as mm. you grow – as you open up that second location, as you go from you know Customer tens of customers changes. to millions, you lose it, and you tend to oversimplify it, and you tend to either focus on the customer, will the customer like it, or you'll do some kind of demographic persona generational thing, you know that our customer is a you know Gen Z housewife, whatever, um, and and that's when you start to really lose it. That's when you 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 lose that. That, that more intimate understanding that you had when you were a small business. We're, we're speaking with Peter Fader, who's a professor, a professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. His latest book is The Customer Base Audit. When you, did anything surprise you when you wrote the book? Because you seem to, you know, you, you know an awful lot about 
the data and the the customer as a whole. But did you learn? Was was there something that surprised you in writing this this particular? Yeah, book? there actually actually was. So when it comes to the the overall metrics, we focus on these five lenses of how to look at the customer base, uh, and we could talk about that if, if there's time and interest. Uh, that stuff we, we kind of already knew. I mean, the idea for the book, my uh, my first co-author Bruce Hardy uh, first emailed me in 2004, saying we need to write a book on the customer base audit, just to kind of lay out a lot of the, the things that we've been doing academically. So the biggest surprises come in from co-author number two, Michael Ross. He's a practitioner, an executive over in the UK, and his ability to tie all the metrics and data to actual activities on the part of the firm, that's where the surprises arise. So as one specific example, we have a chapter where we bring back the product dimension. We spend most of the book just talking, customer, 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 don't worry about the product. But we bring, bring back the product dimension and we see some really interesting patterns there that are certain products, certain uh, SKUs that tend to be disproportionately associated with higher value customers. They're, they're kind of the, if, if that's the first product they buy, it's a harbinger that this customer is going to be a good one. You know, keep your eye on customers like this. So it's really interesting that, that beyond just the pure transaction log stuff, taking into account some of the, the more day-to-day -day business activities, products they're purchasing, channels they're purchasing through, uh, campaigns that they're responding to, um, have very strong associations with value and obviously gives you a lot of leverage to know how to use them more effectively. I had to laugh when you mentioned Michael Ross being from the UK. I, why, why are all the planners that have to uh, use data, they all con seem to come from the UK? The, 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 you know, you actually there's there? something to that. There's <laughs> something about the educational system where Michael and Bruce are teaching a, co a course over at the London Business School where they're laying all this stuff out there. They've been doing it for a couple of years and it's, again, it's very rigorous it's the kind of thing that if we tried to teach it here, our students would revolt. Yeah. They say, you can't expect us to do all that. It's hard. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but over there, they can, they can hold students to a higher standard. I think they get more out of it. And some of it eventually does spill over into actual practice. I had one quick question about um, product, a tangible product versus a service. So does, is, this mm. app, is, is this applicable for either or? So you, there's a, there's an area I think you talk about Netflix and kind of the the fall off of Netflix, but as a service. But is it can, do these principles cover both service they and do they do yeah. they do? So yeah, and this is a question I get asked all the time, and no one believes me when I answer it, which is to say I don't care what you're selling, product or service, B two B, B two C, big and complicated versus small and mundane. Um, all I care about is the nature of the relationship with the customer. So is it something that's being bought on a subscription basis or is it something that's being bought more on a discretionary basis? And if you think about it, that transcends product versus service. You know, there are some services right. that you get a subscription for and some that you just buy when you want. Same thing with products. So that's what I care more about is, is that kind of contractual versus non-contractual sort of thing. And of course, it gets more complicated than that. You have hybrid models like Amazon Prime or your local gym with a subscription and discretionary purchasing. But, 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 but that's the main focus for me as opposed to what is the thing that we're selling. So in that model you were just discussing, value must play a huge and, and it must be an unusual variable. So if it's a service, do I value Netflix or Disney Plus or HBO Max on a monthly level? And, and there are, must be consumers who look at it completely transactional. Like I wanna watch Star Wars, I'm gonna do it for one month and I'm gonna cancel it after that. And, and that would be like a churn rate, I suppose. Sure. Right? So actually it's a, it's a great example that in situations like that, where people will kind of come and go with their subscription and then sign up again and let it go again, then I wouldn't even count that as a contractual business. I'd count that as a discretionary, that you're signing these short-term contracts. Uh, and so I would say that's just a discretionary business. How many contracts have you signed up over the last five years? So again, it's, so it's less about uh, you know, what is being sold and more about just, just the nature of the behavior. Uh, and we see that all the time. In fact, in a lot of our models, will explicitly allow for churn and then signing up again and letting people go through those cycles and absolutely take all that into account. 
So if, if, if Netflix hired you, for example, um, or let, Paramount Plus might be a better example because they're one of the trailing or smaller streaming platforms. I had, if I were sitting on the Paramount team, I would want to know from you what I need to do to change my content to increase the value. Whereas you're actually saying that may or may not have a, uh, if I'm hearing you correctly, that may or may not have an impact because if you don't understand who is buying these subscriptions, the high value customer versus someone who is completely transactional, no matter what you put on the platform, they're not going to hang around for two or three months or they're not going to become a long-term subscriber. Is that something you encounter with some of the corporations? Oh, yes. I love that. I love that. We've actually done this several times, like with, with Spotify, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's first calculate the lifetime value of every one of our customers. Uh, and let's look for those high value ones and ask, what kind of content do they consume disproportionately more than the so-so customers. So if we're looking at certain kinds of artists or programs, it's not just a matter of, you know, how many times have people viewed this content? It's which customers are doing so. And you look at recently, uh, HBO, uh, the big announcement, they decided to, to get rid of Westworld or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and you wonder about that. I wonder about that. Uh, and if they, if they told me, I didn't talk to them about this, that it was only being consumed by low value customers. So it's not kind of worth our while to keep it around and to promote it or whatever else. Fine. Great. Maybe a good idea. But if it's being consumed by high value customers, even if only if there's only a few of them, then you want to keep that around because that might be the thing that's keeping these people uh, within HBO. So very often it's those kind of niche products or content that, that are keeping those high value customers around. You want to be very, very careful as you're making these kinds of, of product decisions, be very mindful of who's buying and consuming it. Are, are there any companies that come to mind immediately that are employing your uh, techniques and doing it well? Yes, indeed. And it, my, a lot of my books are kind of a, a great big valentine uh, to companies like Electronic Arts. A lot the of the EA, gaming really? companies, okay. they really, really get this. First of all, uh, you don't have to convince anybody, anybody, not just the marketing people, but everybody buys into lifetime value as the North Star. And they're using it to drive every kind of decision, including what kind of games to develop. So instead of just going to the R&D people and saying, hey, come up with a cool game. We need a blockbuster. They'll say, hey, we got these really valuable customers over here. Come up with something for them. Uh, and the guy who used to head up all of data analytics for EA, a guy named Zachary Anderson, he really got this. I mean, I learned far more from him than he learns from me. He left recently and is now a, a, a deploying the same kind of magic at NatWest Bank over in the UK. Gosh. So it shows that you can actually take some of these, these insights, not just the data and the patterns and the models, but even the way they, they apply to product development and, and campaign management and customer experience and use them pretty broadly, even in, in very different kinds of sectors. That is so fascinating. And while you were answering Tim's question, a word came to mind. I don't know if it plays into this passion. So when you describe the game, I, I'm super surprised that your answer involved the gaming industry and that they understand this. And, and the more you went into it, I'm like, okay, I get it because I know people who buy into the platforms and stuff. So um, we talk a lot in our, our field, Tim and I, about this esoteric passion thing. But is passion part of this equation as well? Uh, yes and no. Or would you uh, put that in the value category? So, so for me, personally, it's all about just behavioral data. data. Who bought what when. But when I identify those high value customers, I want to say what makes them different. And we've already discussed it might be the products they buy, the channels they buy through. But we can often overlay an attitudinal survey and say, what makes them different in terms of how they think about the company or just their worldview? Are they optimists, pessimists, lovers or haters? So very often we can bring in those kinds of characteristics in phase two to, to, to say, you know, what sets those high value customers apart so that not only can we get a couple of better products for them, but we know better ways to pitch them. We know which kinds of emotions to, to, to get into. So again, I have no expertise about that. But we, I just provide the engine for more traditional marketers to kind of come on in and, and, uh, and deploy their craft uh, in, in, a, in a better way, get better results for it. 
and I'm doing it already. So yeah. if you were sitting in front of me presenting, I would be picking up on a lot of that high value stuff, like the, those customers. Then I would ask, well, is there a passion point? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and it really is a great question. A lot of the projects that I do, so I've taken a lot of this, this research and I've co-founded a company called Theta. And that's all we do is, is we, we, just, we just give you the lifetime values, but we'll very often partner with consulting firms, ad agencies, analytics firms who have some kind of you know, customer experience score or maybe they're using net promoter score or something else. Uh, and to lay that on top of the models to start to get to the why. Because I'm not really a why kind of guy. I'm much more about a what, who, when. Uh, but obviously, we want to know the why in order for to, us to, to make better decisions. So I'm a, a big fan of doing that. But it's just a matter of knowing our priorities. Bringing that stuff in is step two. I'm, I'm going to ask you to take your, maybe your professor hat off. Or maybe put your professor hat on. So the um, higher education is going through a, mm. a real reset and a reboot. And places obviously like Wharton or UPenn with lots of resources will obviously survive. What, what do, do you have a, could you predict the future of what you think will happen based on this customer audit philosophy? You know, could That's you- That's clever, Tim. <laughs> well, could you apply this? And I, a little selfish for me too, because I'm on my, my college's alumni board, but you know, so many places are talking about how are we handling new, this whole reset of students and more online and so forth. Do you? Oh, it's a great point. It's a great analogy. And, and you know, we're riding high at Wharton in the University of Pennsylvania, and we're figuring that, that all of that turbulence on the horizon doesn't apply to us. We're, we're, we're fine. Our product is so good, people right. are going to keep lining <laughs> up to buy it, even if we're not that good at delivering it compared to other schools that might focus more on teaching or might focus more on multi-channel education. Right. So I, I absolutely feel that, that we are very customer centric. That we, we focus on our product and we kind of put it out there and we say, come one, come all. And by the way, it's going to cost, you know, 10% more than it did last year. And we keep getting away with it. But a lot of other schools, lesser schools, are finding that they really do need to lean into certain kinds of students. Right. And they need to really, instead of just saying, hey, who can teach what course? It's, hey, we got, the, we got a really valuable niche over here. We're going to develop a specialized program in, you know, analytics or neuroscience or something. And we need to focus on, you know, that kind of content. And we need to be able to deliver it through lots of different channels in the classroom and online. So the kind of schools that are getting squeezed in the middle are actually being much more progressive about this customer centricity thing. Now, look, I don't want to be too critical about, about, about Wharton. We are doing some, some serious experimentation right. with some of those modalities, but it's still more on the margin than it is front and center. So it's a really, really great point. Right. Well, we want to thank you for joining us. So we could probably have you on for for a full hour. So yeah, Tim, I was just saying. Back yeah, I'm like, I'm like I want to have him back, and let's do it a whole hour. <laughs> I know we just we just touched the surface. So we want to thank you. It's uh, Peter Fader, is professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. He has three books that are out. Do you want to tell us the? Uh, well, it's Customer Centricity is your first one. The other one was the Customer Centricity Playbook, and now you have the Customer Base Audit, which you can find at. Uh, Amazon, I saw them all there, as well as wherever all good books are sold. You can purchase these books. And uh, we appreciate the time you spent with us. Is there a, a website you'd like to uh, let people know how they can contact you should they have interest? Uh, I, I don't hide very well. If anyone no. finds this stuff interesting, <laughs> intriguing, provocative, just Google my name. But I do encourage people to, to, to reach out. I love this conversation. Again, I'm saying some things that, are, that go against the grain. So hold me accountable, and I'd be glad to talk more well, about it. Well, I'll, um, I'll give you a compliment. I, I went down the rabbit hole watching a bunch of your videos on YouTube. And mostly when we have authors on or whatever, I skim, skim, skim. But I, I all of a sudden looked at the clock. I said to John, you've got to watch some of these uh, lectures yes. that you've given at various yeah. places. So congratulations, and again, thank you for joining us. I appreciate and, the and Tim, words. Tim and I have been doing this for almost 15 years now. So when Tim calls me and says, I want you to check out Peter's videos, and I'm like, really? <laughs> because that's not his MO Rare. usually. He's like, he's a good speaker. You're going to really enjoy talking to him. <laughs> well, that's so, great. That really does mean a lot. And I, and I, I hope that you're the harbinger of, of lots of other folks uh, showing similar kind of interest. Well, thanks, Peter. Have a, have a successful and healthy 2023. And uh, again, thanks for joining us here in the Focus Group. 
good conversation, Mr. Nash. Did you learn a, learn a lot of? I learned a lot, and I and here's how I know I want to have. Here's how I know I learned a lot, and I want to learn more. <laughs> I really enjoy talking to him. Yeah, no, and did. you know what I really like about it? Um, he kept his focus on what he does right. best, which is he he analyzes and understands the c- consumer and their value, et cetera. You and I listen to this, and we automatically layer in all the rules that we know about, you know, what's the emotional state, what's the price, but, and the four P's play into this, right? Right. Product, price, placement, promotion. Um, I think it's fascinating stuff. I really do. Yeah. And the other part I like too is he was honest. I thought I might've thrown him a curveball on the the education question. (laughs) What do you mean he was honest? Like, no, but a lot of people, well, a lot of people sometimes will dance around that sort of thing. And he wasn't afraid to hit it head on that there's a, there's an issue with, um, not just Wharton, but any school, if all of a sudden you're spending a quarter of a million dollars and and parents want to know, well, what's my return, right? What's my return on investment? You know, for for our listeners, Tim has been on his alumni board for a while, or alumni, was it alumni board? So the the alumni association, yeah. The alumni association for a while. He loved, and Tim had a, I I got to see Tim's school on one of our road trips years ago, and I fell in love with it too. If I went there, I'd be, I'd be very, uh, (laughs) I'd be very happy. But you've been sounding the alarm bell on higher ed and smaller schools at least for five years now. Right. That are, like, well, they're tuition dependent. And there's rumor that 25% will go out. I mean, my school, Marietta in Ohio, Marietta College, has some great, unique programs. But location's an issue. They're tuition-based schools, so they rely on t- their tuition-reliant schools. Have a decent endowment, but not in the billions like a lot of, like Wharton would have or pen. So it's a struggle for higher ed. And so many people now think they, they said a lot of people have, have watched parents have watched their students that during the pandemic were online and watching the classes as maybe moms in the kitchen or the sons at the dining table. And then they're yep. thinking I'm paying, paying I'm for? paying 60,000 for this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it's uh, really turned the whole world upside down, but that's that's another whole show, Mister Nash. Get, I'd like to do a show right. on academia. I've read a lot recently about good yeah. students, bad students, good teachers, bad teachers, good schools, bad schools. Yeah. Anyway, that's going to be that's yeah. that's it for us, right? Yeah. So thanks for joining us once again. Be sure to uh, find out all about us at focusgroupradio.com. We remind you to arrive and live. Don't text and drive. I always say it backwards. <laughs> I don't know why to. Don't, don't text you and text it. Are you the one? Do you yeah, don't text and drive. Arrive alive. There you so, go. Uh, yeah, and we'll see you uh, on Unbutton next Tuesday. Take care. It's the Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.